Hello, I'm Chris Alvarez, and welcome to Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar. We're located on the web at warscholar.org and militaryhistorypodcast.com. Thank you. I'm speaking with James Carl Nelson, uh, author of The Polar Bear Expedition. He's uh, the author of four uh, books on the U.S. in World War I, and uh, we'll be talking about his this latest book. Thank you for speaking with me. You're welcome. Happy to be here. So first, tell me, how did you get into studying and writing on this subject? Uh, well, my first book was about my grandfather's experience in World War One. He was at the uh, First Division and was shot in France at the Battle of Soissons. So that got me interested in World War One. Um, a small story about that. And subsequently, I did five lieutenants, about five uh, young Harvard educated men in the same division, the first division of World War One. Then I did a story about uh, Clifton Cates, a famous Marine who uh, made his bones in World War One and wound up uh, becoming Marine Corps Commandant in 1948. Hmm. And then this was actually suggested to me by my editor at uh, uh, HarperCollins, Peter Hubbard. He had seen a link to, there was actually two uh, invasions, if you want to call it that, in Russia. One was in Siberia, one was in the northern Russia, which I cover. And he sent a link to my agent and said, hey, I wonder if there's a book in this. And I started looking into it. And I decided that the Archangel end of the expedition was the most cohesive and interesting mm -hmm. uh, story to tell. And it's, it is quite an untold story. Um, and so I wrote up a proposal, submitted it, and they took it. Okay. And away we went. So I just kind of delved into the research. I only had about five months to research and write it because they wanted to coincide with the 100th anniversary of uh, last year of uh, when they actually landed an Archangel. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a really fun one to, to write. Um, I learned a lot. You know, you have to learn and then regurgitate in your own words when you do this stuff. Um, so I learned a lot myself. So tell me about the, um, so obviously the subject matter is, you know, the title gives a subject matter, but what's the focus? Well, the subtitle of the Polar Bear Expedition is The um, uh, Heroes of America's Forgotten Invasion of Russia, 1918, 1919. And we really wanted to tell, what I like to do is tell human stories, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the suffering, the sacrifice that goes into war in general. Um, so that, that's the focus. And of course, we had to tell the bigger picture of why these guys wound up over there uh, in the fall, winter, and spring of 1918, 1919, what they went through and uh, what the upshot was, which turned out to be very little, really. So what was the, um, what prompted this this invasion? I guess, you know, we had the, the Bolshevik Revolution and Russia pulled out of World War I. Um, right, yeah, the, that was it. Uh, you know, there were two fronts. There was the <clears throat> front in France, everybody's very, pretty familiar with anyway, not everybody. But then there was also the Eastern Front, which is, just as large a war between the Russians and the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians, uh, Fr uh, Germany, or Russia, I'm sorry, had actually invaded uh, Prussia uh, at the start of uh, World War One in August of 1914. And so that became a long rambling front unto itself, a um, little bit more movement than on the Western Front. Everybody's familiar with the stasis on the Western Front. Um, so when uh, Vladimir Trotsky, uh, I'm sorry, Vladimir Lenin, came to power in late 1917, uh, he took Russia out of the war and he had pledged to do so. Uh, and they signed the Brett's Livatsk Treaty in March of 1918. That freed Germany to send 80 divisions to the West. And a lot of those divisions took part in an offensive that launched on March 21st, 1918. It's aimed at splitting the French and British forces and winning the war before America could really get up to scale. America had declared war uh, on in April of 1917, but they were struggling to get enough men over there. And it was a gamble that almost worked. Um, by uh, June, the uh, vanguard of the German forces were 35 air miles from Paris. So the Allied command, chiefly the British uh, and French at that point in time, uh, were casting about for some way to uh, alleviate the pressure that the Germans were putting on them. And they arrived at the solution of cre recreating the Eastern Front, uh, making uh, the Germans returned to the front, or at least keeping more from leaving, um, by uh, building up a force uh, in the east. Uh, they So they, they thought that when they landed some troops, they'd get great support from locals, anti-Bolsheviks, um, so-called whites. Um, 
And they also wanted to reach out to this uh, strange conglomeration of troops called the uh, the Slovakians, this uh, the Czech Legion. These are former prisoners of war of Russia who were being allowed to leave uh, the country through Siberia, and they were on trains headed east for Vladivostok. And they hoped to join the uh, the fray on the Western Front and fight against the Germans. Mm-hmm. Anyway, they thought that they could reach out to this uh, traveling bunch of actually very good soldiers, turn them around to the east, uh, and basically, yeah, uh, start a new war in the east. They, they, they had grand visions of, you know, taking Vologda and St. Petersburg and even Moscow and undoing the revolution at its uh, at its most extreme point. Uh, the plan was to do that in the British minds anyway. So they pressured Woodrow Wilson, then U.S. president, to join, and he was very reluctant. He didn't want to take any resources away from uh, the Western Front, uh, but the Allied Supreme Command okayed uh, the sending of American troops uh, in uh, the spring of 1918. And finally, in July, uh, Woodrow Wilson acquiesced and, and said, okay, we'll send one single U.S. regiment to Archangel. I don't want them getting involved in the politics. I don't want them fighting. They're just there to assist in any way they can. And so that's why the 339th Regiment of the 85th Division, which was training in London or in England uh, in July of 1918, was uh, sent packing, uh, issued winter clothing, and found themselves landing in Archangel in far northern Russia on mm-hmm. September 5th, 1918. So, did what was the makeup of this regiment? Were were they from all over the U.S. or was there a specific region? They were mostly from Michigan all over Michigan, and uh, there was quite a few from Wisconsin, too. There were some from Kentucky and Illinois. But the largest contingent was Northerners, which made sense to pick them to go to into Russia. And everybody knows that Russia gets cold in the winter. Also, their new commander, uh, Colonel George Stewart, had done a few years in Alaska uh, with the Army. So he, he was familiar with uh, winter and, uh, and what needed to be done in winter conditions. So pretty much those are the two reasons, and the fact that they were already in Britain, ready to ship to France, they thought, uh, was the third reason that they found themselves boarding transports for Archangel. Mm-hmm. So how did they um, how did they travel? They were in England, and they just headed north and uh, went around the Kola Peninsula, uh, past Murmansk. They were actually going to land in Murmansk first, but uh, there was an urgent call that they were needed in the Archangel region, this uh, ship, the uh, SS Olympia. Mm-hmm. Uh, had actually landed there. Wilson had allowed the sending of a ship, and these, these, <laughs> these, fifty of these sailors from the ship. This was in early August of 1918. Hopped mm-hmm. off the ship and immediately started chasing down the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks knew that they were coming, mm-hmm. and they looted everything in Archangel they could find: uh, locomotives, uh, our, uh, food, stores. Um, so he, one of Wilson's reasons for sending. Uh, the regiment in there was that they were going to supposed to be guarding these stores, the munitions that the Allies had sent over the years to help the Russian war effort. Mm-hmm. And here were these Bolsheviks carting them all away. So these crazy sailors went after them far into the interior, and some of them became lost. And so at that point, uh, when these people disappeared, uh, the call went out to the ships carrying a 339th Regiment to come to Archangel instead, and we're going to need to save these guys. Mm-hmm. Ironically, the day they landed, uh, the, the sailors walked out of the woods uh, in fine fettle, really. Mm. So, yeah, I guess my, my geography, I, I got a bit confused there. So Archangel is where, you know, how could you describe, like, where it is? In- I'll look at my handy-dandy map. Pretty much, um, if you're going to travel from England, you got to go past the coast of Norway, and then the Kola Peninsula, and Archangel is, should I show a map? I could show you a map. Sure thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can see this that does any good for you um you can see yeah, that's pretty clear okay good and so you got to pretty much go uh northeast and then sort of southeast to into archangel and then there's the vast interior the Davina river uh running south from there um towards Cotlis, about 300 miles away mm-hmm. so were were the troops properly um supplied and equipped for this mission? Um, yeah, that that was never a big issue. They were issued uh, fairly decent clothing for the time. You know, uh, a lot of wool, um, heavy parkas. Uh, they were uh, issued what they called the Shackleton boot. Ernest Shackleton, the famed uh, explorer in Antarctica, had devised this boot, kind of like a muckluck. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's meant for winter travel and that. The men hated them, though, because they had slippery soles. And so they were floundering around when the snow fell. So a lot of them just ditched the boots and put on eight pairs of wool socks instead. Um, <laughs> they were issued uh, American-made, American-designed uh, rifles that had been uh, made and designed for the Russian army. Um, the Mosan Nagant. The men hated it. Uh, they had to turn in their, their Springfields. Uh, the, the, the joke was that it could shoot around corners, that the aim was so terrible. <laughs> so they had to adjust to that. They, they, initially, they didn't have any artillery whatsoever. In the fall, a couple of Canadian batteries were sent in, which uh, actually helped. They did a lot of damage uh, as, as things developed. Um, otherwise, so there weren't a lot of cases of, you know, what you'd expect in 50 or 60 below zero temperatures. There weren't a, wasn't a lot of frostbite uh, or these kind of, of things. But uh, they did have disease. Um, in the first weeks after the transports landed, about 70 of the men died from the flu. They had been on these uh, transports that had been in the, the East and the Pacific and were carrying the, the Spanish flu. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, 70 of those men died and uh, were buried in uh, the environs of Archangel, while others got a touch of the flu and then carried it into the in- hinterlands where they infected all these peasants who had never encountered you know, Western people or anything like that, um, had been pretty much spared and were very vulnerable to uh, these kind of diseases. Mm. So that was one great hindrance. So how much? So how many of the um, the Americans could speak Russian, or did they depend on the other nations' troops? You know that the, the regiment had a lot of immigrants from the cities, like from Detroit. Um, so uh, they had enough Russian immigrants, uh, or, or Polish, say, that there were men who could speak the language uh, and, and make some kind of communication. Um, they also had they had some loyal whites who worked for them, the so-called uh, Slavo-British alliance. Uh, uh, these were actually the, the joke was that they had emptied the jails in Archangel and they gave them the choice of either, you know, staying in jail or joining the army. And so these, uh, some of these men were bilingual and they, they helped with uh, communicating too. Mm-hmm. So what was the um, command, command structure? Because um, I think I read something that it fell under the British or the French. It was the British. It was fell under the, uh, the British, the aegis of the British um, and uh, George Stewart, the uh, colonel of the 339th, pretty much abdicated his command as, as soon as they landed. Um, he he was trying to follow Wilson's instructions not to get involved. To just make, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to guard stores, help out how we can. Um, but as soon as those transports landed, uh, the first battalion was sent southeast up the Davina River. Third battalion went right down the railway line towards Obozerskaya. I mean, they just, just jumped right into the, free, the fray. And under the uh, command of the British, mm-hmm. was this just thinking back? Is this the first time that U.S. troops fought literally on Russian soil? Yeah, first and only. And oh, yeah. Um, did you get so what? So the book is it sort of? Would you say it's more about the men in the field, or how much does it become political or strategic, or uh, what's the approach? Uh, the approach is is the men uh, in the field and, and the, the battles. They fought some pitched battles. Um, that's really my interest. Um, of course, I had to lay out, as I did previously with you, what mm. this was all about. Why were they even there? Um, so really, I have to jump in really in the first chapter. It kind of lays that out, you know, um, and brings it to the 339th in the next chapter. And then... Pretty much, uh, I have a very literal mind. It kind of just goes kind of time-wise from September through June when they finally got out of there. Mm -hmm. And and talking about, you know, the battles they fought. um, I mean, there's one company, Company B, was uh, on the Davina River at a place called Tulgas, about 100 miles south of uh, Archangel. And even as the uh, peace terms were being signed uh, in a railway car in the Campania Forest in France on November 11th, 1918, they were being besieged by Bolsheviks. Hundreds of Bolsheviks had attacked their camp, uh, whether coincidentally or not, I don't know. Um, and they fought a pitched three-day battle, lost uh, a dozen men. Uh, it was there that the Canadian batteries of uh, artillery really came to, to play and, and really saved their, their bacon. Um, <coughs> But uh, so that's just a, an instance of uh, it wasn't it wasn't just skirmishing. It was, it was pitched battles. These guys fought under, under terrible conditions, even by November 11th. 
it was probably, you know, 20s, temperatures in the 20s. There's already several feet of snow on the ground. I mean, we're talking far north. So I imagine they weren't engaged in the kind of trench warfare that was going on in the West. Was it a different type of warfare? Yeah, what they did, you know, it's almost more like uh, Vietnamization. Um, you know, they would, they would take over a village, um, fortify it, you know, build some snow trenches around it, um, and try to just hang, cling to that piece of territory. Why they didn't really know. Uh, there was one company, Company A of the 339th, was sent 250 miles up uh, the the Vaga River, which is a tributary of the Davina, and isolated um, by themselves with some uh, white troops as well and a, a battery of Canadian artillery. And the the uh, fourth platoon of Company A under uh, Lieutenant Harry Meade on the morning of January 19th, 1919 was attacked by 1,500 Bolshevik warriors. These are 46 men facing 1,500 Bolsheviks. And they they got routed. I mean, they, all they could do is run for their lives. And eventually, in the ensuing days, the entire company of about 250 men, less 25 who were killed in that initial battle, and in the subsequent days, were on this uh, Hejira, headed north for a refuge that they could find where they could hunker down and go to go on defense. Um, so. You know, the Bolsheviks, as, as the, the so-called war went along, became more and more emboldened. Or they became better soldiers. Um, and uh, they, eventually, the Red Army, uh, at the end of, uh, in the summer of 1919, had 600,000 men. And about 45,000 of them were uh, dedicated to the northern part of Russia to face mm-hmm. off with what was never more than, say, 10 or 11,000 Allied soldiers. Mm-hmm. So they, they were vastly outnumbered. Now... I can't imagine there was much, um, much in the way of air activity going on. If there were all. some. There, there were some British pilots, um, but it was it was paltry, and uh, the Russians didn't really have much for for uh, air. Um, but there was really they were limited to scouting, you know. Um, and there wasn't it wasn't like, you know, in, uh, in the Western Front they used air aircraft uh, to scout send messages where to fire artillery it wasn't that it was really just to to find out troop dispositions i'd say did they use horses or anything they mostly use sleds they use actually use reindeer sleds mm-hmm. uh, more than anything um that's the, the local custom up there and so they pretty much were transported uh, in that manner not so much horses because horses don't do that well in deep snow really right what did the u.s have I, I can imagine that's kind of a learning curve on using reindeer. Yeah, I'm sure. I think they use local drivers. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Did um did any of them express any satisfaction, or or did anyone enjoy being there in, in any way? No, I mean, um, there was a a book written uh, thirty some years ago that's titled "Quartered in Hell" after a poem that one of these guys had written. Uh, no, I mean, actually, it became an issue as, as time went on after the armistice was signed. That word of that got back to these guys. And it, the question became, the war's over. What are we doing here? Um, so it just became this source of frustration. And meanwhile, they're still fighting these pitched battles. Um, men are suffering. They're, they're running out of food. And worse, they're running out of American cigarettes and have to smoke British cigarettes. That was the worst thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> but there are actually small mutinies. Uh, there's one with Company I at the end of March 1919 where they, there was this instance where one or two guys, just they were supposed to be loading up sleds to head south to Obozer Sky, the railway front, they called it. And they refused. And so there's this kerfuffle. Uh, they threw one of the guys in jail. They, they were read the articles of war. Uh, there was another one with Company B uh, in the winter, about February, I think, of 1919, where this certain platoon uh, wrote and signed this petition saying, we're not going to do anything more. We're not even going to go on patrol or anything until you tell us why we're here. So mm-hmm. it became uh, kind of a dicey situation. And then there were there were full scale um, mutinies by some of the Russian uh, troops, the French, mm-hmm. um, and even um, among some of the British troops that had been sent in. So, yeah. They never got a good answer. Yeah, it sounds like they were kind of taking on some of the Bolshevik ten- tendencies there. <laughs> well, it's funny. This one guy, Silver Parish, with uh, he's a corporal with Company B. He actually said uh, 
he said, <laughs> and then one of his, I think it was a letter home, he says, we're, I'm, we're the bolo, they call it the Bolsheviks bolos. We're all bolos in my platoon. We're the bolos. They were totally, they were like sympathizers with the bolos. You know? hmm. Now, did they have, uh, can you discuss sort of their supply um, lines? How, how did they get supplies? And also their medical, what kind of medical did they have support? They didn't have very good, they didn't have very good medical. They had some, you know, what we call, I guess, they had medics, barely trained. Mm -hmm. uh, they taught how to, you know, they taught the bones of the body and how to put on a bandage. And that was about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but they did what they could, you know, um, and supply wise, otherwise they, they were pretty, had a pretty secure supply line from Archangel. Like I say, mostly by sled, uh, winter came early there a mm -hmm. and before the rivers froze, the Davina and the Baga river were fine for transporting, um, uh, you know, weapons, food, whatever was needed for the men. They, were, they never really ran out of anything. Did you get a sense that their, their level of camaraderie? was maybe higher than other regiments might have been just because of their situation. Yeah, I, th I think totally. You know, I've, I've written about uh, three separate, now four, I'm doing a different book now, about four uh, separate uh, divisions, regiments. And there's a whole uh, section of the library, the Bentley Historical Library in Ann Arbor, Michigan, at the University of Michigan, that's do dedicated to the polar bears. I mean, there's just so much material. There's In the Western Front, you're not supposed to uh, keep a diary in case... Mm -hmm. You were captured or killed and fell in the hands of the enemy and they knew your division where you'd been where you were going you know these kind of things um but there's tons of diaries from these guys uh letters home uh, and i think yeah i think they bonded probably more than uh, any other unit american unit anyway in uh, world war one simply because they were isolated and together and they're all going through this common suffering experience together so mm -hmm. at, at the end of the war when they finally got back to detroit less to 235 men who were killed or died of flu or wounds, um, they immediately formed the Polar Bear Association to commemorate the, their, what they had gone through, the, the men that they had lost, and to just keep uh, the story alive. So do you, did they meet regularly then? Yeah, they did until they all, you know, as it happened, they all died off. But now there is uh, some of the descendants that started the Polar Bear Memorial Association, also mm. based in Michigan. Okay. So um, before we turn, I'm going to turn towards the resources you used, um, but are there any other significant secondary issues um, that you explore that you might want to mention? Uh, well, one kind of cute story was of, like, eight of these guys brought Russian brides home with them. Um, mm -hmm. That was kind of a, that like, it's, it like happens in war, right? Um, uh, let me think, was there any other secondary? Uh, now, the common thread really is just, uh, what are we doing here? It's freezing, <laughs> you know, and I mean, they were they were in some really serious combat One, uh, at, the, at the end of uh, March and early April 1919 at a place called Boshi Ozerki, just uh, west of Obozerskaya. Company M was attacked by 7000 Bolsheviks. Mm -hmm. So there's probably a company M and some some loyalists, maybe a few French uh, uh, hanging on for their lives. And they wound up inflicting casualties of 2000 mm -hmm. on this force of 7,000 Bolsheviks. So, I mean, there's, this was not, like I said, this was not skirmishing. This, uh, the Bolsheviks were determined to push him into the White Sea and they, they gave it a, a shot. Mm -hmm. But when they, when they realized the Americans and, and allies were pulling out, they just, uh, there, there had been concern that uh, how to get the men out in uh, the spring of uh, 1919, mm -hmm. uh, they were gonna be attacked, you know, cause then they'd be most vul the vulnerable because they'd be away from their fortifications. Mm -hmm. But uh, Leon Trotsky, who's the Minister of War, uh, just basically said, the, if they're leaving, good, just let them go, and we'll get on with our civil war here. Mm -hmm. you know? Interesting. Do you know, if, do the Canadians and British have their own sort of polar bear type associations? No, I don't think so, because you're talking about, it was like, you know, uh, the British were like, you know, the 14th Highlanders, you know what I mean? So they were already mm -hmm. unique groups. And like I say, there was only a couple of Canadian batteries, you're talking you know, 50 men, something like that. So uh, no, it's not. But I'll tell you what, it is, uh, it's not known till my book, huh, just kidding, um, that this happened, this this uh, invasion. Uh, but in Russia, they haven't forgotten. Um, they teach it in schools. And, you know, because it was a serious event, their country wasn't invaded. And uh, even Khrushchev, I think in 1956, 
uh, said, you know, you Americans think that uh, we we never fought each other, but no, you 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 came into our country and, and tried to overthrow us, you know. So, and we're well aware of that we don't forget, you know. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so now, as far as the resources you used, um, how did you do your research? Where did what archives did you use? That sort of thing. Well, like I mentioned, the Bentley Historical uh, Library was great, and they have a most a lot of it is digitalized. Uh, they want you to get uh, permission to use everything, but you can, you know, you're free to use anything. Um, so uh, that was a great resource. Uh, I mean, some of these diaries are hundreds of pages long. Mm -hmm. Great account, day to day stuff. Um, their letters home. Um, and luckily uh, for me, um, three of these guys, actually, three separate instances, uh, wrote books about this. Harry Costello was with the uh, company I, no, he's with the machine gun company. He wrote a book simply titled, Why Did We Go to Russia? A question mark and it's a kind of a diatribe against the whole experience um then there was another book archangel um john cottahay wrote a uh, similar thing but a really ex sort of expansive really well-written book uh he was with company b and then there was a book uh, the history of the americans uh fighting the bolsheviks uh by joel moore and harry mead uh that is a really good account of all what's going on all with every unit, the medical unit, every company, uh, that was a wonderful resource too. So you mentioned that there were uh, immigrants in this group. Were there any anything written in not not in English? I I wouldn't know. I don't, I, I don't, you know when I was doing my first book, my, my grandfather was a Swedish immigrant, and uh, yeah, it occurred to me because I was looking for letters, I was contacting people and stuff. But it's like if those guys were writing letters home. Yeah, you know, they were writing them to you know Germany or Russia or wherever they were from mm -hmm. in that language. Uh, so I no, I never came across anything uh, in, in another language. Okay, and um, how much does the army have in their historical archives or or whatever they might have? Do they have much on this? Yeah, I mean uh, the National Archives uh, has uh, I, I, that was another resource I should have mentioned. It has company uh, reports, company logs, um, really good accounting. Um, I found on, uh, what's that, that uh, website, 30, anyway, um, that, that they put a lot, there's been a lot of, there There were reports written by these guys that are in the archives. Uh, mm -hmm. There was one overall report by the guy who replaced Stewart at the end of the, the invasion who laid out the history and, and reasoning and stuff like that. So there, there, was, there were reports about Prisoners. Uh, I mean, there were about 20 guys taken prisoner uh, and instances of that. There was a report written on the, the mutinies by the very ally, various allies. Uh, so, yeah, that was another good uh, repository for, for the book. Mm -hmm. hey, did you or have you come across any uh, artifacts related to this? Well, I went to uh, Detroit uh, last September. They had a, a event commemorating uh, the landing at Archangel on September 5th. And I gave a little talk. I just showed some photos that I collected of, of guys. But they had a whole uh, this guy Mike Gravel. He's the, the president of the Memorial Association. His grandfather was in Company I. He's collected uh, for that association. I mean, he had probably fifty overcoats from these guys, and they all had this. They made a significant or a, a singular patch to wear, like a pole. It's a polar bear that they sew on their their clothes. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of that. A lot of helmets. Uh, so in that one place, there's also a museum in Frankenmuth, Michigan, that Mike is always also involved with that has a lot of material from the mm -hmm. bullets, weapons and stuff. And, and you said it's a museum. People can. Yeah, it's actually a museum. Uh, I can't remember what it's, if it's called the Michigan Military Museum. I can't remember what it's called there yeah. in oh. Frankenmuth. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so what part of the research for you is most enjoyable? Um, I think, you know, I think uh, just discovering uh, first person uh, material when 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 men uh, talk, you know, in their the way they they write when they write it in their own words and say what's going on. That's the, that's the kind of thing I really enjoy, as opposed to sterile official reports or sort of this or that. So as far as keeping a diary, this just struck me in, you know, the dead of winter. Did, did they use pen or pencil or how was it written? Uh, it looks like it mostly looked mostly pencil. Oh, okay. Yeah, some of the stuff was hard to read. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, they they had uh, 
they had brought with them um, Vickers machine guns, which are water cooled. And what happens to a water cooled machine gun when it's 50 below? <laughs> so imagine what happens to a pen. But they actually resorted to sleeping with the machine gun at night in an attempt to keep it from freezing so they could, you know, fire at the Bolsheviks the next day. And that didn't work either. It was just too cold. Wow. Yeah, that's that's, a, that's, a, that's another element how, how maybe how ill prepared they really were. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What was the most difficult part um, of the story to research? For me, I have to say, um, I'm pretty good with uh, like individual stories, anecdotes, these kind of things. For me, it's always grasping the big picture and really laying it out. That's all, like I say, when I do this, you have to uh, learn. I had to learn about the first division and their operations and you know where they were put and why. Same with the second division when I did the, the book about Clifton Cates, the Marines. And the same with this. Uh, that's always the biggest learning curve for me is really understanding, you know, why we went over there, uh, what, what what Americans were doing in Russia. Uh, so, yeah. Was there anything that uh, that you discovered that emotionally moved you either positively or negatively? Um yeah, I think, you know, I, I lead the book off with a uh, sort of a snippet of uh, when Company A was attacked. Um, and that was that that's kind of heart wrenching because these guys were just being slaughtered. Uh, so that was one element. There was also an element when Company B was attacked on November 11th. <laughs> there was this great story with this uh, one of the commissars with the Bolsheviks had this woman with him and they were in love and they were traveling through the forests and swamps together and uh he wanted to kill all the the, the wounded and sick in the hospital that uh company b had set up but she stopped him mm -hmm. um i thought that was very poignant and then he was later killed in, in the battle around that village uh, in the ensuing days where she went over to the allied side and actually i think she became a nurse or something so those are the kind of human stories that uh, i really like to, to touch on mm -hmm. Um, so what do you hope the book will do? Well, I hope number one, it'll educate people about, you know, what these guys went through the sacrifices and, and, and like I say, it's an untold story. Uh, there have been a couple books written about it over the years. Um, uh, but I think, you know, as the years go by fewer and people, fewer and fewer people were even aware of this. I mean, I was sort of, uh, aware just hearing about it through research of my other books. But never really thought to stop and really take a look at it until uh, Peter Hubbard got interested at Harper Collins. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope it's educational, you know, and uh, uh, really just tells a real human story about a, a sideshow. It's a sideshow war, you know, mm -hmm. a slice you, of American history, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, as you pointed out, uh, it's still very much alive in Russia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, well, you know, and I was writing it under the cloud of all this uh, collusion uh, stuff with Trump and all that stuff. So it was still really in the forefront of my mind. We didn't know where that was going to end up at the time, you know. Uh, but yeah, here we are a uh, hundred years later. And uh, there's still the history of Russian-American relations is still tortured. And, you know, that's, uh, that's what really kind of poisoned uh, American and Russian relations from the get-go. Uh, but the thing was, uh, we left, but uh, Russia really needed us to recognize them. They needed access to our markets for their economy and that. Uh, we finally gave them recognition, I think, in 1933. But in between there, there was kind of a, an early Cold War. We just really didn't have much to do with each other. Uh, but then there was, a, you know, obviously we were allies in World War II, mm -hmm. uh, followed immediately by another serious Cold War that lasted about 25 years, right? So um it's it's been a tortured history that really kicked off with this uh, little invasion that we pulled mm -hmm. um did you have any difficulties getting the book published or finished no oh, no 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 i mean you know this is my that was my fourth book i mean you know i have an agent and uh you know my agent is great his name's jim hornfisher and you know he he binds you know, publishers and I, I'm doing another book for HarperCollins now. Um, so, the, you know, 
the difficulty in, in getting a book published is your first book. That mm -hmm. is really usually the toughest. Uh, to, 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 if you're serious about it, you can always self-publish, I guess. But, you know, if you're serious about it, like I was, I said, I'm not going to self-publish. And so you got to find an agent. And then if the agent takes you on, you got a pretty good chance that you're going to you know, be writing and selling a book. Um, so, you no, know, at this point, it's it's not uh, difficult. The difficulty is, you know, what to write about. So what's next going to be? Right. Yeah. Did you have any issues where you had perhaps more material than um, than you could put in the book and it had to be cut out? I probably left some things out. Um, I can't really think of anything right off the top of my head. Uh, it kind of, I'm a fast writer and it just kind of flows. And I just, I don't sit down and do an outline or anything like that. I just kind of, I just kind of jump in and see where it's going sometimes, you know, and uh, that's sort of see the seat of my pants. That's how I like to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, so I don't have any big issues in, in trying to write these books. And I don't go back and edit myself like crazy. I'm not anal about that. I let someone else do that. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. Peter Hubbard is a great editor, man. He he really he really was an editor. He did a great job on this book. Okay. So, yeah, you know, but my other books, it's like, all right, yeah, let's send it to the copy editor. You know, so this is a good experience for me mm -hmm. to not be lazy. So, can you give a, a few more details about your this current um, new project that you're working on? I'm working on a book called The York Patrol about Sergeant York, the, you know, the most famous American soldier of World War One, and uh, the 16 men who were with him on the day when he supposedly single-handedly captured 132 Germans uh, in the Aragon Forest. So mm -hmm. it's pretty much just telling the full, most accurate, truest story and account of that day and the days before and the days after uh, that's been written. When do you do you have any sort of idea when you hope to get that one out, that one published? Yeah, it's uh, well, you know, they give you a deadline for for books. Uh, so the, the manuscript is due on April first, and it's usually about a year after that by the time they edit it, and legal it, or whatever needs to be done, and get, you know design it. So that's what my so probably spring of twenty twenty. Okay. No, um, no, spring of twenty one. Yeah, we're yeah. coming up to twenty. Yeah, okay. sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it does. Um, so where can people find you on on the web? Uh, I have a James Carl Nelson Facebook page. Uh, I have a uh, I will. My third book is called I Will Hold. I have an I Will Hold page. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously I'm on Amazon. Uh, uh, yeah. So not, not, I'm not. I, I, I think that's about it, actually. But yeah. OK. So <laughs> The I will hold pay. Which the that's URL? the one about Clifton Case, the Marine. Yeah. What, which is it? Just I will hold dot com or which? Oh uh, no, it's Facebook. It's Facebook. Oh, so okay. it's just simply I will hold. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Uh, no, I think you'll enjoy the book. I I, I try to like I, I try to write books that are not. I'm not an academic. I'm a storyteller. That's what I tell people. And mm -hmm. I think you know. I want people to be turning the page. What happened next? What happened next? I mean, so that's I think uh, people will enjoy. It's a fast paced book and uh, I think they'll they'll learn a lot and enjoy the reading of it at the same time. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for speaking with me. Thank you. Thank you for watching. You can find more videos like this on YouTube at War Scholar 1945. You can find the podcast version of this show on your favorite podcast feed under the title Military History Inside Out. You can find more great military history information at warscholar.org, on Facebook at Warscholar, on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Warscholar, and on Twitter at Warscholar. Please support me by following me on those sites and liking my videos. Thank you.